Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on the uh, Team Leader Supervisor uh, Assessment Plans. My name's James Rockley, I'm Director of Bus Business Development, um, and my colleague, uh, Mark Hubbard, who's our uh, Senior Endpoint Assessment uh, uh, Assessor, will be uh, taking you through the two assessment plans, uh, APO2 and APO3, for the Team Leader Supervisor. Um, Amy Wiles, our events marketing coordinator, who you've no doubt been in touch with, will be monitoring uh, your questions and providing us with some technical support should you need it. Uh, before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to the top right hand side of your screen where you'll be able to see a small control panel. Uh, from here, you'll be able to select your audio options and type in your question as the webinar progresses. We'll try and answer your questions um, before the end of the session and we'll probably look to answer them as we go along. So if anything occurs to you as we're talking, please feel free to pop your questions in and we'll address them as soon as they turn up. Um, you also have a facility to raise your hand um, if you're struggling with any technical issues and Amy will be able to uh, give you some support if you can't hear us or you can't see the slides, etc, etc. Once we've finished, there will be a, a, a little survey that pops in um, after we close down the webinar and uh, we do ask for you to uh, fill that in um, because it helps us identify you know, where we did well. Um, it also looks at you know, ensuring that we're hitting your expectations uh, with regards to these webinars and also what webinars we might want to do in future. Um, I will just say that um, before we start, the uh, slides will be sent out um, after the uh, the session is is closed, um, and we will be looking at putting the recording of the session onto our YouTube site. I'll give you more information at the end of the session. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, what we want to look at today is um, I'm going to give you an overview of the endpoint assessment journey, um, the gateway readiness, uh, scheduling of assessments, and then Mark will take over and take you through the ins and outs of the APO2 and APO3, looking at assessment methods and supporting documentation. He'll also be giving you some hints and tips along the way uh, for preparing for a successful um, endpoint assessment. So, if we look at the um, endpoint assessment journey with Highfield, many of you will already be aware of this. Some of you may not have put any learners through um, endpoint assessment, but I just thought I'd reiterate it for everyone. So it all starts with uh, contracting, and that's when Highfield receives from the training provider the employer confirmation form, which allows us then to contract with you. Once we've got those contracts in place, um, you're able to register learners. Now, we do suggest that you register learners as soon as you've identified them as apprentices. It doesn't cost you anything to register uh, learners with Highfield. The only time we charge you is when we're looking to book your endpoint assessments in. Uh, we do ask that they are registered, though, uh, at least three months before you're expecting those learners to be assessed, if possible. Once they're registered with us, they'll be on program until they hit Gateway. Um, and then you'll be able to conduct your gateway meeting uh, with the learner and uh, the employer, and uh, you'll be able to schedule your uh, assessment at that point. So you can call our scheduling team um, and uh, book the learner in for their endpoint assessment there and then. Once the uh, assessment has uh, been booked, they'll take place and the results will be um, uh, released within 12 days of the final assessment taking place and then uh, if the learner is successful we'll be informing the ESFA to issue the certificates after 10 days of those results being released um, because the, the learner has an opportunity to appeal against the decision. Um, if the learner is unsuccessful they will need to go through the process of either a retake or a reset uh, depending on uh, the methodology of the, uh, the, the assessment that's been failed and how many they failed. Um, rule of thumb is if they have failed more than one element then they will need to go through a retake. If it's just one element um, they will need to go through a reset. So um, in terms of, of looking at your um, 
your gateway point. So for gateway readiness, um, there's some slight differentiation between the two um, assessment plans. So for APO2, you're looking at the level two functional skills in maths and English as an achievement. And for APO3, you're looking at uh, the functional skills and the portfolio. Um, the document you can see um, next to that information is actually the, uh, the gateway readiness form, which is effectively the last document you would supply to us saying, we've covered all of these outcomes, we're com confident that the learner is ready for assessment and we'd like to put the learner forward. We will then check to see we've got everything we need for the gateway um, in place. Um, if not, we'll contact you um, and you'll be, alert, you'll be able to um, upload the documentation that you need to upload through the um, Highfield dashboard. So I mentioned uh, in the process for um, the on program that you'll be able to schedule your assessments during your gateway meeting um, you can pick up the phone to Highfield and uh, speak with our um, uh, scheduling team we don't have an automated service so it will be a person answering the phone um, in within three rings um, we can provide you with uh, assessment dates over the phone um, this is obviously very standard dependent so um, if there are standards that have um, assessments that can't proceed until the learners achieved a particular element then there might be a conversation to be had about penciling something in that might be moved um, but for this particular standard there shouldn't be an issue in booking all of the assessments all at once uh, you'll receive confirmation in writing uh, within two days of making that uh, booking with the scheduling team and there is an opportunity if you need um, bespoke arrangements being made um, for assessing candidates perhaps you've got a specific arrangement with a, a, an employer we can talk to you about um, you know moving outside of those things but you do need to talk to your employer engagement team to make sure that we can manage um, you know what you're looking for so in terms of uh, the uh, the timeline for the uh, APO2, we do have a timeline available through the, um, the the website. So if you were to go to Highfield Assessment and look for the particular standard that you're interested in, the majority of them have a timeline, as you can see. Um, this one is for APO2. The APO3 one is currently under development. Um, if it's not already out uh, already, uh, it will be very soon. Um, and it just says uh, what to expect and when to expect it and who needs to be where. So um, if you move on to the next slide, um, we can see that in a bit more detail. Um, this, as I say, is downloadable from the Highfield Assessment website on the Apprentice uh, support page. So if you go to uh, Highfield Assessment, have a look for the uh, standards. It'll be by sector. Um, pop into one of those and each of the, uh, the the standards that we offer has a support page where you will find documents such as this, but also things like the Endpoint Assessment Kit, uh, which will obviously point you in the direction of, of how to put together materials for your Endpoint Assessment. So uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mark, who will take you through the uh, two assessment plans for today. So good morning everybody and thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, so my name is Mark Hubbard, I'm an endpoint assessor with uh, Highfield. I've been undertaking this standard now for two and a half years and was the, the lead assessor on this, uh, on this standard. So as we've talked about, or as we're about to talk about, there are four component parts to TLS APO2. The first part being the portfolio of evidence, which we'll talk about in slightly more detail in a moment. And there's the knowledge test, which is a one hour multiple choice questionnaire. And this can be invigilated by the assessor or remotely. Um, if it's by the assessor, it normally happens on the day of the actual face to face uh, endpoint assessment. The other two parts of the, um, of the EPA are the competency based interview and the professional discussion. So we take a moment to look at the pass criteria of all of the four uh, component parts the learner needs to achieve 50% in each of these um, and the total score the total maximum score is on the right hand of the screen uh, for all four parts of the um, of the standard now you can see that they conveniently add up to 100 and assuming that 50% in each component part is achieved then the pass is 50 to 59 and merit is 60 to 69 and the distinction is 70 plus 
So we sp let's talk now a little bit more about the portfolio of evidence. The portfolio of evidence assesses knowledge, skills and behaviours from the standard that are not assessed in other parts of the endpoint assessment. Scoring is out of 30 AC, so there's going to be 30 uh, items to score, um, which is then uh, divided by uh, 30, multiplied by 20 to give a total score, and the pass is 10 out of 20. We kind of expect that there will be between 10 and 15 pieces of evidence uploaded. Um, certainly would suggest that not less than eight, um, but again, if there's slightly more than 15, that's not a problem. So the key thing to a successful portfolio of evidence is understanding the difference between knowledge ACs and skills and behaviors ACs. So if we just take a moment to look at the, the knowledge ACs first of all, um, these can be answered by academic work or learner reflection. So for example, one of the first, um, I think it's the third one in, uh, K8.2, explain the terms unconscious bias and inclusivity. So a good academic um, definition of that will be able to score that. But care needs to be taken on some of the other knowledge ACs in that, for example, K8.1 is explain how to be self-aware. So whilst the definition of um, being self-aware might be good, the learner needs to explain how to be self-aware to really score that AC. In terms of where the evidence is located, we use the high field mapping matrix and that's provided to all training providers. Um, and you can see on this form um, to the right of the screen, you've got the evidence name, which might be um, uh, PDP or appraisal or PDR. And then we ask the training providers to give it a, a, an evidence reference number. And that can be EB1, evidence one, or reference one, or whatever you'd like it to be. And the evidence type column on the right hand side there is whether it's a witness testimony or, or whatever it might be. But the key thing here is the reference number that you're going to sign to it because we're going to ask you to save the evidence using that reference that you've assigned there in the top part of this document. And we also ask please that uh, the evidence and the mapping matrix is uploaded by midday uh, prior to that on the booking confirmation and is all in one um, zip folder. So the second page of the the mapping matrix is um, shown on the right hand side. You can see that the uh, evidence reference number there, reference one in this particular uh, example, is, is assigned to the first AC. And there is consistency, you can see all the way down that column of reference uh, two or three or six. And, and, and therefore there's a clear kind of logicality to the evidence mapping. And again, I just want to emphasize this one more time, please, that the document is actually saved as reference one, and it could be reference one PDP or reference one appraisal, um, but the assessor is really gonna look for reference one in the saved documents that are uploaded within Dropbox. To the right of um, that. Sorry, okay. Mark, I just wanted to interrupt with a question. Um, yeah. So in terms of uh, the uh, evidence uh, column so if you've got um, reference in that column and you've got more than one piece of evidence within um, that area and you're looking at the page locations um, mm -hmm. can we add more than one um, yes. piece of evidence against each criteria so in the in the evidence column um, what we we ask is that it runs from left to right obviously but the the location column should then be chronological in the same order and what you'll find this is an editable PDF form and it will expand with your typing. So there's plenty of room there to add things. In fact, if you look down at S8.1, I think you will find that there it's expanded where the it's been typed in the first column some more. So um, what I would just say about that is one or two or three pieces of evidence that you feel is appropriate, but I think if it's more than three, um, it really really the evidence should stick to one or two items, if, if not a third, but not more than that. Did that answer the question, uh, James, okay? I think so. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So just, just to reiterate, on the right-hand column of the page, you've got the evidence location, and this is fundamental. Uh, we do see a lot of what is put in the left-hand column appears in the right-hand column, so it might be reference one in the evidence evidence reference which is great but then we see reference one in that column and please do use this 
right hand column with the page and evidence location to show the page number or the timestamp if it's on a recording. I think you can see one there between uh, six thirty minutes and, and ten fifteen. Um, and again, it could be on two pages. There, there's a, a the second one down is uh, page one to two. The other thing that we ask is you in your uploading of audio and video recordings, please can you ensure that they're in MP4, MP3, or MA4 format so the accessor can play them. And so let's just talk about some um, hints and, and tips in choosing the evidence for a successful portfolio of evidence. So as we spoke about a second ago, the key is understanding the knowledge, skills, and behavior, the different types of AC. And as we spoke about a second ago also, uh, K8.1, explain how to be self-aware, show the definition is really good, but the key to this is the, 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 the apprentice or the learner explains how to be self-aware. With regard to behavior and skills, um, what we're really looking for here is evidence of these being demonstrated in the real, real work environment. So these might be PDPs, performance reviews, appraisals, feedback from a manager, peers, customers, project updates, reflective accounts, uh, or also uh, verified witness testimonies. So it's really demonstrating that the, the, the learner is, is showing that competency um, within the workplace. Um, another one that pops up quite a lot is S9.3, create a PDP. And we see a lot of things here, such as um, CPDs and, and other documents. And really, we feel the best practice is to show a PDP. And within that, we're looking for around about six items that will demonstrate the, the personal development plan, which may include work items, or it may include, um, what should include rather, uh, things like um, personal development, which might be confidence building or public speaking and at least an attempt to put those into some sort of smart goal. So where you take a, a subjective thing like building confidence, um, the actual uh, objective goal might be to handle team meetings effectively within their department. Another one is uh, S8.1, reflect on own performance. Uh, and this will be a good opportunity for learner self-reflection to uh, indicate this, uh, this AC. Well, okay, Mark. I've, I've got a couple of uh, a couple more questions for you. Okay. Um, so one of them is um, if there's a bundle of evidence that uh, the training provider is going to supply, um, uh, can they provide them uh, in a zip file, or does yes. it have to be bundled appropriately? No. What what, what we would envision is that the documents with the mapping matrix would be bundled into as into one zip file marked as portfolio of evidence with, for the learner and that way the because there'll be a, a bunch of other things within the uh, within job box that are uploaded such as gateway documents or, or functional skills stuff so just having the one zip file there marked as portfolio of evidence with the mapping matrix within it would be great um and the other question is um about uh, submitting evidence from uh, an e-portfolio system such as uh, one file or other can the yeah. uh, training provider do that yeah that that's that's fine what we find with one file is that the narrative that is written by the learner to answer certain questions that are on the uh, within one file that can be easily accessed um, once it's uploaded. What we find is there's a little box and we just click on the right hand corner, expand it so we can read all the narrative from the learner. Where we have difficulties on one file, if, if there is a hyperlink within it, then that tends to be a problem finding it. So just to recap, if there's narrative that's written within one file by the learner, that's great. If there's a link within one file, that tends not to work. Okay, and uh, one final question about submission of evidence, and then I'll let you get on, um, is um, do they have to use uh, the high field matrix to submit the evidence? We, we really strongly suggest that you do because um, all of our assessors uh, understand that and we think it provides a, a very logical approach to doing it. However, if you really don't want to use that, that should be a conversation with our employer engagement team who will be able to uh, approve and discuss it with you and uh, take on board uh, any issues you might have. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to the competency-based uh, interview. 
so the comedy-based uh, interview lasts 60 minutes and is led by the assessor. And key within this is that the learner states actual situations where they demonstrated the competencies. And um, one of the things I'd like to remind learners before we undertake it is not to say things like, I would do this because that's future tense. And we really want to hear about uh, where they've demonstrated the competency in an actual real life situation in the past. And the, the learner is uh, permitted to have notes. So if they want to have examples uh, ready to uh, talk through on the, the interview, that's absolutely no problem at all. We'll talk about some hints and tips within the uh, in the conversation. So I think um, as well as understanding all of the conferences and being ready to share them, it's good for the learner to have a, an overview and understanding of um, the framework or the structure of the competency-based interview. And you can see here that I've listed it as 27 ACs across 60 minutes. Three of those ACs have two marks. So we've really got one mark, 30 marks in total. So we've got uh, one mark every two minutes, which is a, a nice amount of time. If you know you took the stopwatch and you were going to answer a question about that, that's a nice good amount of time, but it's not an excessive amount of time. So key within this is fulfilling and rounded answers, but not to dramatically extend too much. And one of the things that we advise our assessors, not just in this standard, but in all standards, is that we don't want to interrupt the the apprentice giving their, their best information and the, and the best evidence they can, so they won't interrupt them. Um, and I think, you know, briefing a learner beforehand by the training provider and certainly by the assessors before this, they understand the, the framework of that one per two minutes. And my experience is that um, we come in around about 58 minutes to 60 minutes answering all of the ACs. To move on now to the professional discussion. Um, the framework of the professional discussion which lasts 40 minutes is around the um, CPD log. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side there, there's only there's only four ACs there, but each one of those ACs is worth five marks. Uh, Highfield provide all of their assessors with exemplification, which details the makeup of those five marks um, so that everybody is scored in a fair and consistent manner. And if one were to describe what the professional discussion is generally about, it's about what the learner wanted to get out of the apprenticeship course before, the what things they wanted to learn, what skills they wanted to develop, uh, what they actually did learn and how they're using it in their job role, including the, 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 the apprenticeship's confidence and what are the next steps they're planning on their learning journey. Let's just talk about some uh, hints and tips regarding the professional discussion. The very first AC is keep and maintain a CPD log. So the assessor is want, going to want to see that. Um, and there's several ways that that can happen. They can either be uploaded to Dropbox um, for the assessor to access beforehand, or it can be shown to the assessor on the day of the EPA. Now that could be by the um, learner sharing their screen, or it could be there just them holding up to the camera. That's not important, but the key part is this part underneath. Um, it needs to show the activity undertaken, what was learned, and how this is being used in the learner's job role. And that's the brief for what a CPD should look like. Now, it might not be called CPD, it might be called reflective, um, reflective log, it might be merged with uh, the guided learning hours, but those three component parts need to be seen um, to score in that first AC. Another part that comes up later on is the building of the, the uh, apprentice's uh, confidence, and that will be discussed uh, midway through how they feel that it's been developed and how they uh, are planning to in, um, grow their confidence still further after the uh, conclusion of the, um, the endpoint assessment. So it's good to show their work CPD as well as the apprenticeship learning thing, uh, learning items. So whatever, and most times this is applicable that they can show work CPD on the log as well. And the end of the professional discussion will focus on how the learning journey will be continued after the apprenticeship has ended. And that might be academically, it might be having a mentor, it might be uh, exposing themselves to uh, more um, meetings and uh, projects, or it might be undertaking additional uh, work CPD. So that's the conclusion of APO2. Are there any questions anybody would like to ask?
Right, currently we don't have any questions at the moment. Mark, um, is anybody frantically typing even as I speak to be able to uh, drop some questions in? Um, I think, oh, right, okay. So um, Gary's asking about uh, when APO2 will be phased out. My understanding is that I need to check this, that everybody going forward from um, October has been doing APO3, but I would want to check that before giving you a definitive. We're certainly seeing a lot of APO2s coming through, but I believe that that's the backlog, but I think going forward it's all, all APO03. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Ah, right. Okay. So um, the question is about uh, remote assessments. So um, for the time being, we've got uh, APO2, team leader EPA, um, uh, still having apprentices who are based at home for quite some time. Um, so um, how long will remote assessments be in place for APO2? Um, I think because there isn't a, an observation um, necessary, we would be free to keep that ongoing. It, the dispensations yeah. tend to be for standards where the observation is and how that can be temporarily replaced. So certainly the vast majority for the last 18 months that I've been doing with, with APO2 have been, uh, have been remote. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, of, of standards that have uh, an element that is part observation, there is there has been dispensation um, to allow us to do um, those remote um, uh, assessments either by witness testimony uh, or along those lines but um, uh, TLS has always been uh, remote or face-to-face -face. Um, where the learner is during that remote is largely down to the learner um, and if they're comfortable taking their assessments based at home then there shouldn't be an issue okay I think that's got the question. Brilliant. Um, okay, so um, do you want to um, move on? Um, and I'll pick anything up that comes in in the meantime. Okay, so we're moving on now to uh, level three uh, TLS APO2. And we started um, uh, assessing these or went live with learners. I think the first one was in February. Um, so Within TLS uh, APO3, there is just two parts. We've got the presentation and Q&A and a professional discussion. Um, although there are less parts than ACs in APO3, the assessment criteria is wider ranging. There's an example just on the screen now, TB1, which um, is, is one of the first uh, assessment criteria. So explain how they use knowledge of leadership styles and facilitation of Cross team working to develop their team and, in, and individuals and improve performance and how this helps them drive their team to meet objectives. So I think you can see just from that one, there may be less ACs, but the level of detail, the level of parts that need to be covered is, is quite significant. And one of the things that we've advised our assessors to do is they'll print this off and where it's met in the presentation, they'll sort of cross that out and then they'll look for anything that hasn't quite been covered or in enough detail in the Q&A to make sure that's covered and therefore the, the AC has been fully met. Um, the whole pass distinction criteria has changed from um, APO2 in that each section, the presentation Q&A and the professional discussion, has a set of ACs which are pass ones and a set which are distinctions. And to get a pass, you need to pass all the pass ACs and to get a distinction you need to pass all of the pass ones and the distinction ones and you can see there's a listing there of the ACs and the distinction ACs for each of the two component parts. If either part is failed it can be retaken and if this is successful the overall grade will not exceed a pass. So looking at more detail about the presentation and the Q&A, the presentation topic is allocated to the apprentice by Highfield Post Gateway. And the four topics that we've identified are uh, reviewing ways to reduce costs and increase efficiency in a business environment, implementing a performance management process within a team or business unit, supporting their team through a period of change within the organization or managing a difficult situation within their team. And uh, I think change within an organization 
so much as that happened, a lot of people will, will jump at that opportunity and have lots of rich evidence to give. The presentation itself is 20 minutes. There is a mandated 10 minute break between the 20 minute presentation and the 30 minute Q&A. Um, Q&As are really fab because they allow the assessor really to, you know, unlike a professional discussion, I'm sure you guys are aware, they allow the, the assessor to really get in there and you know get any detail or further clarifications needed to score as many ACs as possible and give the learner the best opportunity uh, possible to get either a pass or a distinction. And the presentation is submitted prior for the assessor to prepare questions and to view and to get themselves up, up to speed with it. And the presentation is the learner and the assessor only. This is actually in the guidance. Um, however, I would say that 98% of the assessments I do is just me and the learner anyway. So moving on to the professional discussion. The portfolio of evidence is submitted uh, before the EPA for the assessor to review. This is a 60 minute structured professional discussion again with the only the learner and the, the assessor present and um, the portfolio of, portfolio of evidence will be discussed um, to demonstrate competency and of course the, the learner may refer to their portfolio throughout the uh, discussion. Uh, can I just uh, jump in there Mark? Um, uh, we've got a, a note from uh, Caroline, um, could you just summarise the main assessment uh, mechanisms um uh on the uh the the, the I standard i go through yeah okay so it's a, yeah it's a it's a presentation with q a and it's a pd two things okay is that answered the question caroline okay uh, and I just uh, I did a quick double check while uh, you were talking. Um, so in terms of the uh, the TLS, I believe the um, any learner that started their um, their program uh, post June 2020 will be on um, APO3 going forwards. Um, the October date, I believe, is for ODM. Okay. Any more questions, James? Um, that's it. Okay, so um, there isn't a report within this, unlike some other some other standards. So the scoring is undertaken purely on the the presentation, the 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 the, the presentation which is submitted beforehand is not marked beforehand. So it's all about what's in the presentation. As you've seen a, a moment ago, there's a a lot of detail within the AC. So one of the things that we recommend is either have notes on the PowerPoint presentation and to really use that, the, the learner will need two monitors or to have lots of written notes there to ensure items are covered because PowerPoint, um, PowerPoint presentations by their very nature tend to just be bullet points that the learner will expand upon. Now, as well as undertaking the project in a logical way, there are um, assessment criteria which might not necessarily lend themselves to the beginning, middle and end of the, of the project, such as team building and development, communication, organisational culture and strategy. So what we always recommend with, with this one and with any other presentation is that having undertaken the presentation or the project or presentation in this particular standard, that the learner goes back to all of the ACs and, and just ticks off that each AC has, has, has been undertaken. Because as I said a second ago, um, not all ACs immediately lend themselves to inclusion of the project being presented in a chronological way. So moving on to the professional discussion, this lasts for 60 minutes. It's based around the prior submitted uh, portfolio of evidence. It's assessor-led. There's 13 ACs, although pretty details, as you've seen beforehand, uh, 66 distinction ACs. And the what we've done is we've briefed our assessors to um, ask six competency questions across a range of learning outcomes subjects. Um, they, they are required to do that but they will then ask any additional questions as necessary to score the ACs and get the maximum um, or to allow the, 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 the learner to give the best evidence that they can to get the maximum score that they can. So let's look at some hints and tips regarding the professional discussion. Um, 
please do note that reflective accounts and apprentice self-evaluation are not permitted. Um, a really well-structured uh, AC by AC uh, portfolio of evidence will really help um, to guide or to structure the, uh, the, the, the professional discussion. Um, and you can see some of the LOs there are building a high performance team, project management, organizational governance and managing self. Just talk about, I think a lot of those are self-explanatory, but probably the one that becomes slightly problematic is organizational governance. And one of the things that we, we, uh, we describe that as uh, is um, having a system of checks and balances. And whilst the organizational's total uh, governance may not be appropriate at this level for a learner. The sort of thing that we're looking for is the rules, um, sorry, the, yeah, the rules within the company that underline or are backed up by either regula regulation or, or legislation that the, that the, the company must employ. Um, maybe I can give you an example of that. Um, I did a, an endpoint uh, an endpoint um, assessment with uh, a well-known airline, and one of the things was that they needed to check that the visa um, were appropriate for people travelling to another country, and that was a very kind of serious point um, that was uh, a rule within the business. But that was backed up by legislation that if the passenger flew to another country and their visa was found not to be in order. The airline would be fined significantly and they would need to um, be put back on a flight coming back. So there was clear um, organisational governance that they wanted to ensure that they met the legislation that was in place. So just to reiterate, good strong uh, strong structure for the PV will aid the discussion and the, the uh, assessor will, will prepare good open-ended questions as um, particularly from the, the, LOs, the LO items that we've mentioned above. Um, you should be aware also that most, most pass ACs look for describe or explain, whereas most distinction ACs look for evaluation. Now, the other thing that you'll find in APO3, unlike APO2, with the exception of the MCQ, is that there is reference to theories within it. So a good understanding of some of the basic management theories allied to how they have been used in the workplace by the learner will really support that evaluation and, 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 and give rich evidence for a distinction. And with that in mind, it really is a good idea to undertake mocks with the learner beforehand to um, uh, check that they um, have a full understanding and they feel comfortable with each of the ACs. And that's the end of the presentation there, so I'm going to open up for any questions. Uh, right, okay, so have we got any questions? Uh, okay. I'm not seeing anything, I don't think we've already covered. Um, is everyone typing frantically? Uh, right, okay. Um, Lynn's um, asked about um, uh, sample transcripts of discussions. Um, I don't think there are um, transcripts that would give examples of the professional discussion, but there is a guide document in the uh, EPA kit which covers all of the um, the outcomes um, for the, uh, uh, the 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 assessment. It's very similar. It's, well, it's quite similar, I, th I believe, to the. the the documentation that the assessors uh, use, um, but I don't think we give you a sample discussion per se um, for the um, the practice element. That's right, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we will use it internally for standardisation, but I don't believe that we we, we publish them there or give them. Anything else? Okay. Um, if there's anything we've we've missed or haven't picked up on today, um, uh, by all means you can drop us an email. Um, and if you are still typing in the box, I am still uh, trying to uh, look at the details. I've got another question. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so first one's the easy one. How long before you get results? Um, once the last assessment's taken place, uh, the results are released within 12 working days of that assessment. Um, so they will be released onto the Highfield dashboard. Uh, you'll be notified by email. Um, anybody who's got access to the dashboard uh, will be able to see those results of that learner along with any feedback we've supplied. Um, uh, okay. Uh, right, okay, somebody's asked about the, uh, I believe the Ops Departmental Manager webinar we had uh, yesterday, um, whether or not you can access the recording. The recording will go on to our YouTube channel um, in the next uh, week or so. Um, that'll be uploaded and if you want to go there now and, uh, or indeed after this session, uh, and uh, 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 subscribe to the channel and uh, click on the uh, the bell icon to let you know when new content has been uploaded. That should be able to uh, inform you that uh, we've uploaded a new webinar. As I said at the start of this, um, this uh, session as well is being recorded and it will be loaded onto our um, YouTube channel as well. Um, I'm just reading through a, a question uh, through, okay. Right, okay. Um, in terms of uh, the in-depth uh, knowledge that learners need to present on theories, um, do they need to, to go into a great deal of depth? Um, uh, so... Um, no, no is the answer to that question. It's, it's more about having an understanding of the theory and how that may or may not be applied in a work real life situation. So if one, one is going to mention uh, Maslow or Theory X and Theory Y, one would need to um, a brief definition of the what it what it looks like, or sorry, the definition of it, uh, and and then how it did or it didn't relate in in the workplace for that learner. Right. Okay. So I've got another question um, that's about witness testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and, and whether or not that can be on video. I don't think that's, is that not, that's not relevant to this particular standard, I don't believe. Uh, uh, not for this one, it's relevant for APO2 as evidence, that, that, that is okay. Yes, we can use that. Yeah. Okay. It, I'm assuming that would be MP4. It, uh, it would need to be, because um, that's one of the ones we would accept, I would have thought. Um, but again, the, the, sorry to interrupt you, James. Um, that's right. The time, the the time stamping is is key. Um, you know, between three minutes and eight minutes, or whatever it might be. Yeah, has that answered your question, Gary? Right. Okay. So, um, excellent. Uh, I think we've. Oh, right. Okay. Bear with me. Uh ask a question about uh, whether or not the presentation has to be on PowerPoint. No, absolutely. It, it doesn't need to be on PowerPoint. It can be um, of the learner's choice. Um, again, I think the key thing to remember is there's a lot of detail. It, there might be, you know, just 16 ACs, but there's a lot of detail within them and it can be whatever is their uh, preferred option. If they want to just sit and, um, and read or talk, then that's absolutely fine. Um, another question, um, this one's from Lynn, uh, about the, uh, is there a limit to the uh, amount of time that professional discussion can be on audio? Uh, I'm assuming it's provided as evidence as part of the, uh, the portfolio. Um, there, there, there isn't a limit, but one would think that, I mean, you know, people up, uh, upload 60 minute recordings, but then they, what they do is they, on the mapping matrix on APO2, they say, okay, this AC is met between 10 and 12 minutes, and then uh, this AC is met between 15 and 18 minutes. So you can, you don't, you don't need to have a separate reference number for um, each AC listed on there. You can just say it's reference one, and this this time frame is between eight and 12 minutes, and later further down the mapping matrix you might refer to uh, reference one again and say okay the the the, uh, the the time stamp for this is between 20 and 22 minutes that's absolutely fine in fact it's much better to do that rather than just call the same piece of evidence another reference number 
Okay, hope that's answered it. Uh, right, okay, so um, question is, how does the assessor decide what project they need to do? Um, there's a, a, a learner working in a company who are making redundancy, so project change would be um, on the cards for those particular learners. That is actually, um, of the four subjects that I mentioned earlier, that is actually decreed by um, by head office. Um, James, I don't know if you can help me with which department will actually choose that. Um, I'm assuming it would be the it would be the, uh, the 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 quality assurance and assessment team. So that might be something we need to get back to you on, Andy, um, in terms of confirming um, you know uh, how we we go about um, confirming that uh, particular project. Um, so if you can leave that with us, we'll get back to you. Any more questions? Okay, so um, in that case, I'll start to draw things to uh, close whilst keeping a sharp eye on the list of questions as they pop in. There we go, there's another one. Uh, if the project title doesn't isn't fit for the learner or doesn't fit with the learner, I believe that says, um, can we appeal and have it changed? I think the same is going to apply to go back and get further detail yeah. on that. Okay, we'll get back to you on that, David. Um, we'll have a look into that. I suspect that there. Uh, okay. And I think that's about it. So um, thank you all very much for attending today's uh, webinar. As I said, the copies of the uh, slides will be emailed out to you um, by my colleague Amy within the week. Um, you'll have to wait a little bit longer for the recording um, to go up on YouTube. If you want to, uh, as I say, go along to uh, YouTube and look for the Highfield group, you'll be able to see all of our webinars that we've currently got there. Um, there's some useful information there. And as I said, the um, Ops Departmental Manager will be there shortly. Um, uh, Please do complete the survey at the end of the uh, session. It'll pop up once we've closed down um, the actual webinar uh, and give us feedback um, on how you think it went, um, whether or not we, we, we met your expectations and any information that you'd like to see in future, that would be great. Um, so once again, I thank you very much for uh, attending the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.